Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Getting Hammered. I am your host, Mary Catherine Ham. I'm here with my co-host, Vic Madison's Free Beacon. We are your morning show for any hour. There's a lot going on in the news. We have a lot of uh, Israel updates, uh, some congressional updates from the always peaceful House of Representatives, <laughs> yeah. um, and much, much more, including some student loan uh, news. But before we get to that, Vic, uh, how are things going? Hello, Mary Catherine. Uh, doing fine, and I got great news for you. I did not go blind staring at the sun. Congratulations. Not the only one. Sorry, that's a U2 song. Uh, how was your solar eclipse experience? You know, it was okay. Uh, I feel a little guilty, like I'm an ungrateful participant in God's wonder because I was not properly wowed. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I it think is there's a decent chunk of people feeling that way, but they yeah. feel weird about saying it because everybody else is like, "This is the most amazing thing." Now, look, we were in the we we're in the weird zone, right? We, we are like in the weird zone. Eighty nine percent or something. Seventy five. And here. the eighty. Oh, is it really? And whatever it was, doesn't feel that right. Huge. Right. Uh, however, I do enjoy the novelty of it. It's interesting to me. If I were in the path of totality, I'm sure it would be uh, more breathtaking. Yes. Uh, but I find the whole thing fascinating. I, perhaps, what was most fascinating here, in our uh, in our little enclave of safetyism and and crazy schools, is that apparently some of the schools around here, the public schools, uh, released students because it was too scary to have them. Oh come on! In the school's no. care. Oh, oh this stop! Is, this is a real thing. Oh, come on now. It's a real thing. I thought you were going to say they really, you know, like in my daughter's school to go out to experience. No, no, no. The some some schools closed, saying like we can't be responsible for these children who might look at the sun. Oh, a CYA situation. Yes. Oh, and also just break. because That's we're sad. we're a society that is yeah destined yeah. to 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 crumble. My child looked at the sun under your watch, <laughs> and now he's blind. <laughs> That's a real thing. Yes. So did you have? Any sort of sunglasses? So I didn't because I don't prepare for things. No, I didn't. Uh, I thought about making a cereal box into one of those little viewers, and I decided, no, I have other things to do. I would not do that right. So what I did is I went to pick up my kids around the time because the- um, So they let their, your kids out. Early. No, no. It, that was the time. Oh, it's the time. The release of school was the timing okay. of the eclipse. Okay. So I went to go get them, and their school had generously uh, given everyone glasses, so I just borrowed some from my kids. Likewise, uh, I was outside at the office park right next to us here uh, with a couple of our writers, and uh, there were no sunglasses to be had, but people were uh, generous enough to share theirs because it really doesn't look like anything right. to the naked eye. It, things do seem dusk-ish here where we yes, are. Yes, it is a in, strange light. It's a strange light. It's a strange light that is more like the magic hour towards like summer evening at 8. Right. But uh, it's 2 in the afternoon or 3 in the afternoon. Then you use the glasses and you actually see it. You actually see the moon partially eclipsing the sun. Right. And it's amazing because otherwise, if you look anywhere else with those sunglasses, complete pitch black. You can't see anything. That's how powerful the sun's rays are. I'm here to tell you that. I'm here to tell you that. Um, no. So uh, that was interesting. My uh, my son said he thought it was pretty cool. My daughter said it was lame. Oh. And it was me. And I said, "Why would you? Why would you say it's you lame?" Can't say it out, out loud, she, man. You know, we were talking about like what it's like in the path of totality. And she somehow thought we were in the path. Oh no! And so she was expecting darkness, and instead, it's like dimness. And so she was so disappointed in that. And I, I can I can imagine that uh, that if you didn't know this was coming. Yeah. Right, and you experienced this in the middle of the day in ancient times. Oh you'd be, my gosh! Like, truly. Uh, disturbed yes, by I, what God hath wrought. Um. <laughs> I made I made uh, a few references to the movie Apocalypto. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you know, luckily because they were showing the eclipse in Mexico over Mexico. I said somebody just got spared having their heart ripped out, and I made this joke. And people are like, "What? What, what is that?" I figured, hasn't everybody watched Apocalypto? It you know what? Out, I don't no. think I've ever seen it. The only reason I know about it is because uh, you and Sunny reference it all the time. Yeah, it is a great <laughs> movie directed by Mel Gibson. Human sacrifice. Not many movies about that. I guess I'll have to go check it out yeah. at some point. What is this? Ten years later now? Yeah, uh, many later? more, much more than that. I <laughs> I, I made Kate watch that movie when she was heavily pregnant, and not realizing there's a pregnant 
woman oh, no. in there. Like, oh, no. is she going to lose the baby or not? I'm, and she's in hiding in a well, and then the water is filling up, and, and she just turns to me. She goes, this better have a happy ending. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, please, please. I have that. It did. It did. It had an amazing ending. Uh, Mary Catherine, also, um, uh, did you get many nice birthday presents? Oh, uh, yes. We had a great, uh, great birthday weekend. Uh, Low-key low had a couple things on the calendar. Um, got some gifts. Got some really nice uh, presents from the kids. Oh. Um, I actually was out of town on Friday uh, for work and then came back on Saturday. Yes. Friday was my actual birthday. Came back on Saturday. And when I arrived oh. at home. All four children were sitting at the uh, dining table with uh, a two-tier cake that the big girls had made, wow. decorated, oh. frosted with sprinkles. Dad had overseen but was not uh, doing the work, although I, he did tell me he cracked at about two and a half hours of uh, of supervision and was like, ah, step away from the cake. <laughs> is he, is he, does he know? I don't know anything about cake. Like, I cook. But I'm not a baker, so I wouldn't know what to do. I'll be like, I guess that I mean, looks right. So we go pretty basic on. The, it's not like we're making it from straight scratch. Sure, like we, no, they're kids. But the construction of the cake uh, and the decorating of the cake, you know, was mostly in their hands. Yes. I think at some point he did tell them to like just walk away, just walk, just walk away. I'm gonna finish this off and put it on the table. Yeah. <laughs> and then I got uh, handmade cards from each of the kids. Oh, save those. And there was one uh, that had a handprint from each of the babies. Oh and my I goodness! To, I have to tell you, my monster son, who is fourteen months younger yeah. than his uh -huh. sister, same size hands as her, possibly larger. So um, it's gonna. That's he's gonna. Yeah. Eclipse us. Oh hey! Speaking oh, of which, he's gonna be a he's gonna be a big guy. The uh, big dude. It's 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 funny uh, for us. Uh, the joke is that we have an old Christmas card, and my daughter is about twenty two months younger than my son. Uh, in, in the photo where, you know, he's maybe two and, and right. she's not, you know, uh, they have about the same size head. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, it's I a large... joking about that with my daughter. Anyway. Um, but yeah, everybody was good. And then, you know, good. Vic and I went out to a nice din dinner, lovely. invited Kate and Steve lovely. too. Lo yeah. Yes. 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 That's right. That's right. We just decided we'll make it, you know, uh, the four of us and uh, and other friends. And then uh, and then and then we uh, had a nice little after a visit with our friends, the McCormicks. Yes. And actually, we should give a shout out uh, because uh, we I ended up inviting at the last minute, and I'm so glad she could come. Alex, our former yes. producer. The reason for this is that we were supposed to give her a send-off dinner. This was her send-off. That's Two right. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and we didn't do that. Yeah. And uh, she was newly engaged. Yes. New wish. Yeah. To Colin Anderson. Not to tell all her business. No, that's Okay. Uh, and so that was a good way yeah. to congratulate them and do her long-awaited send-off, which we did not do because I was horribly sick the week that we uh, planned That's it. right. That's right. And then I happened. just kept having babies. So now here we are two years later. Did you feel like, uh, did you and uh, Steve feel like older couple at the dinner? Because that's how I feel. Oh, yeah. No, I was like- They're uh, in a whole other Just world. as when we hang out with producer Jennifer, oh, I'm yes. always uh, flattered that the young's will spend time with us. Yeah. So. I mean, like, what do they think about us? They must think like we're like- I was like, oh, we're going out with the old people today. Tell us about yes. CD players. Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, I think about, you know, the equivalent of somebody being more than, I don't know, 20 years older right. than, of, in my case, uh, than me and what that was like. And, you know, I mean, it's just you want to think about it and you don't want to think about it. But I will say we have been very we have been very blessed with our producers. Yes, they're they're uh... past to present. The, the exception, not the rule in their generation. Yes. For sure. And uh, Jennifer can also look forward to a send-off meal someday if she goes on to bigger <laughs> and better things. Two years later, she too. Yeah. In a, well, yes. Yeah, so I hope I hope to and I hope not to. I'll put it to you. I know. There exactly. You exactly. Maybe we'll take her for one just, you know, just, for doing a great okay, job. Okay. We'll do it for okay. anniversary. <laughs> All righty. Shall we talk about Israel? Yeah. Let's <laughs> comes to uh, foreign policy, uh, U.S. posture in the world, uh, the possibility of World War III, uh, there are some bad things in the offing, including uh, what looks like the Biden administration's real big turn taken yeah. on their position on Israel. That's which right. Which came in the wake of the uh, World Central Kitchen uh, disaster, which was right. in which seven people, aid workers, died because there was a mistake in how the IDF targeted and they thought there might be Hamas gunmen with this uh, convoy. By the way, part of the problem here 
Yes. Is that because a terrorist organization has control over the civilian population in this area, uh, you have to coordinate yeah. sort of with you're, Hamas. You're you are you are cooperating and thereby legitimizing a terrorist yes. organization because they control the shots and they're hopping on and off of these vehicles and riding with the vehicles for protection. And Israel, of course is going way out of its way to make sure they don't make the mistake, yes. but because this is a war and you're operating drones to try to do surgical strikes at night, accidents are going to happen. Well, so. and the uh, the request in the wake of that, by the way, Israel has done an investigation, oh. reported out on the investigation, yeah. fired several of the soldiers who yes. were involved in the targeting. Been there, relieved. There have been... There's been some transparency and there has been there have been consequences, which is more than we can say for a fairly analogous, if not worse, mistake that the Biden administration made mm -hmm. in targeting a civilian family in Afghanistan to retaliate for the terrible withdrawal disaster that he created. Yeah. Um, still nobody fired for that. Correct. Yeah. It was Maybe like one. six or seven children. Yeah. Seven, seven kids in yeah. that one, I believe. Um, so. Israel has been forthcoming with explanations about this. The Biden administration finds these uh, explanations not satisfactory. Do you know how long it took the Biden administration to admit that they killed seven kids? You know, a yeah. long time Yeah. versus what just happened. They also asked, the Biden administration asked, like, you know, there needs to be a change in policy so that you can better serve the civilians of Gaza. And they actually did make a change. They opened a new crossing. Yes. Uh, in response, but the Biden administration remains uh, unfriendly. And uh, let me just give you a, a taste of how unfriendly. Oh, boy. This is uh, Antony Blinken, Secretary of State. What happened after October 7th could have ended immediately if Hamas had stopped hiding behind civilians, released the hostages, and put down its weapons, but Israel is not Hamas. Israel, it, so it starts out okay, right? Yeah, yeah, so far so good, and then... Israel's a democracy. Hamas, a terrorist organization... Democracies place the highest value on human life, every human life. As it has been said, whoever saves a life saves the entire world, Blinken said during a press conference in Brussels, quoting a Jewish proverb. This is the Times of Israel reporting. Here's where it gets gross. It's already taking a turn, but go ahead. That's our strength. It's what distinguishes, distinguishes us from terrorists like Hamas. If we lose that reverence for human life, we risk becoming indistinguishable from those we confront. He goes on to say, right now, there is no higher priority in Gaza than protecting civilians, surging humanitarian assistance, and ensuring the security of those who provide it. Israel must meet this moment. So two things there. Uh, the implication that Israel would become indistinguishable from Hamas by virtue yeah. of a mistake. Right. Also implies that they can make no more mistakes in waging a war, which no. is an impossible ask. And then the idea that in a war... There is no higher priority for the country that has been attacked mm -hmm. and is engaging in a just war. There is no higher priority than the safety of the civilians on the ground being used as cover for the terrorist yes, organization the that's enemy. fighting. That's that's crazy, Vic. Blinken and his speechwriters must have been so pleased with themselves when they crafted this. Like we have found a middle ground. We've threaded that needle it's so that we can still say, you know, Hamas is bad. But I'm just surprised he didn't use one of my sort of rhetorical uh, devices to be sure. To be, to be sure, sure right. Hamas is a terrorist organization. You know, that said. But how can anyone really tell the difference right. anymore? And then go right into without even realizing it, this moral equivalent saying, well, you made a mistake by, you know, accidentally killing civilians. Uh, therefore, you know, is there a difference between you and Hamas? Not really. When Hamas kills it's civilians, when Hamas gets, kills civilians, it's resistance. Right. You know, this is their MO. This is their tactic. Uh, and Israel, you know, in the middle of a war, you know, a terrible accident happens like this because they're trying to go out of their way not to just, right. you know, <laughs> blanket bomb like it's Dresden. No, as I always say, like... They get they, blamed, they and, they're were, the, and they're the enemy. So. If they were truly paid no heed to civilian life, if they truly weren't interested in, in preserving it, uh, if they truly were genociding the Palestinian yeah. people, they'd be done by now. Yeah. It's a very small piece of land. Yeah. Right? It's not a huge population. What they have done is they have used many Israeli soldiers mm -hmm. 
and many have sacrificed their lives mm -hmm. to make it as surgical as possible. Now, thankfully, because of technology, it can be surgical sometimes without having to give up those lives. Um, but the allegations are just crazy. And people yeah. forget, because the media has really taken its eye off the ball on this, mm -hmm. there are women and children still being held by Hamas. Yeah. Six months later. Yeah, including five or six Americans. Yes. Whose names I don't think have ever come no. out of Biden's the president's never talked about mouth, it. No, correct? I don't think so. I don't think so. And Biden released that statement, and here we are now where he and Democrats in the House are talking about um, threatening to withhold aid, weapons, uh, for, uh, aid, weapon, military aid to Israel if they don't have a ceasefire now and leave Hamas in place. Well, Please leave Hamas in power is what they're saying. This and is, on that, that front, we should play yeah. a little bit of a clip of uh, the mother of um, oh. uh, Hirsch Goldberg, Poland, who was kidnapped from the Nova Festival. We know from a video we saw that the terrorists took uh, that he had his arm severely injured, possibly blown yeah. off, yeah. Um, was taken into Gaza. And his mother, Rachel, has been an inexhaustible in her uh, tour of the world to get people to pay attention to this. Um, at the end of uh, November, but there are still eight U.S. citizens being held hostage. And we now know tragically that three of them have passed on, mm -hmm. but they're still held hostage. Their bodies need to be returned for proper burial, and we have five that are still alive. We are the United States of America. We stand for freedom. And Having our people to, held to hostage focus is... Focus on that issue. Rachel and John, our prayers are with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. He is an American citizen. Yeah. And I do not you believe... You wouldn't know it. Like, Biden hasn't spoken to his mom. Biden hasn't mentioned his name, to no. my knowledge. Um, and they're... The U.S. government is, is pushing Israel to make a deal with Hamas uh, that would, you know, release, in some cases, the numbers are... Oh. Ludicrous, like a thousand yeah. Palestinian, uh, sometimes convicted criminals, yes, right? Yes. Who are we're, we're now at the level of almost a thousand base, you know, murderers in exchange for a ceasefire and some a handful of hostages. Right. Of course, Hamas continues to reject any offer yeah. for a ceasefire. One of the reasons they're probably rejecting that is that uh, something we've all feared might be true. There are some reports from Channel 12 News in in Israel that Hamas has told mediators that it does not have 40 hostages That's right. in the humanitarian category that are still alive. That is the category of women, children, elderly, yeah. and sick. The number that they say alive, say is alive, which is significantly lower, has not been made public. Um, this, of, this is the uh, news person uh, tweeting this. This, of course, is a serious obstacle for the ceasefire talks that seem to be progressing. Uh, yeah, because they've killed everyone that they could trade Oops, because they're murderers. And this has been broadcast by most of the media and the uh, you know, protesters. It's a, hasn't talking been about hasn't what been happened. A, hasn't been a huge story because no, how many ceasefires have they rejected? By the way, yeah. Well, here's the thing: if it gets to the point where there are no hostages left, then the plea from uh, the left will just be ceasefire. Well, of course. Then they don't have to say, release the hostages. Oh, they made our lives so much easier. No, it'll be so just convenient. Just say, why don't you have a ceasefire? Israel, There's no hostages. Israel, how could you have the we moral don't know what high, high ground now? There are no hostages. Yeah. That will that will be the line with a straight face. Yeah, absolutely, with a straight face. They don't care. But, so, uh, yeah. Meanwhile, uh, and this is Israel, Times of Israel also reporting, IDF has withdrawn all ground troops from southern Gaza, leaving just one brigade in the enclave. Um, that's worrisome because, and actually we should play a clip from, uh, um, from Coleman Hughes on this. Good. Speaking to Joe Rogan. If you ask the question, what is unique about this war? What is different about this war than all other, other wars? It's, it's not the civilian death toll. The, the ratio of combatants to civilians is, I think it's better than the American armies was when we got ISIS out of Mosul. That was like 10,000 civilians dead to kill 4,000 ISIS. This is 19,000 civilians dead to kill 13,000. Um, it's not. Uh, it's it's not that. You know the the what's what's unique about this war, unlike every other war that I could think of, is is you have a an army in Hamas that has perfected 
the art of embedding itself and meshing itself with civilians so that you cannot hit them without hitting the people around them. Other armies have done this, but none have perfected it to the extent that Hamas has. But his point, more astutely and calmly made than, than I can make it, is always think about what you're incentivizing. If That's too in much fact, to think about. If, in fact, uh, Israel does not win this war decisively and cannot get Hamas out of power, and international pressure is part of the reason for that, whatever ineptitude might exist on a governmental level in Israel as well, which many Israelis are upset about, um, if Hamas is allowed to stand and rebuild... What is the message to every other fighting force, particularly non-traditional ones and terrorists, all over the entire world? Yeah. That you can get the entirety of the Western world and civilized people to essentially side with you by butchering more than a thousand civilians in their beds, in their homes, injuring many thousand others, uh, kidnapping some of them, then uh, perpetrating war war crimes every single day. Yeah. By hiding in schools, mosques, uh, hospitals. Yeah. And then voila, you win. How does that go for uh, yeah. for marginalized people? Yeah. And probably can, you know, get billions of dollars from aid agencies oh, that too. and countries no, once don't the reconstruction that. part comes in. I mean, that's the thing. Right now, they're also making it incumbent upon uh, Israel uh, to provide aid uh, to the Palestinians in, in Gaza. Um, which is like, I don't know, in World War II, you know, uh, saying that the United States has, has an obligation to the, the German and Japanese people, you know, during war. Uh, really, it's the choice of your governments to, you know, I mean, you're suffering because of the, the, their actions in, the, right. in, in these cases. And somehow they, yeah, Hamas, you know, they, they gamed this out. And I, I think it's playing exactly as they were hoping to with, with regard to it's better the reaction than, better than they the could West. have hoped for yeah it's worth it and then you know i mean they they get to celebrate the martyrs and at the same time rally everybody to their side i think i'm i might be borrowing this point possibly from seth mandel uh who works sure. at commentary and is on the commentary He's podcast for, yeah. uh so credit where it's due but um he makes the point that the biden administration seems intent on fighting any war or supporting any war to a place that's like or it gets just icky enough that they don't want to be part of it anymore and then they're like oh never mind we're not doing that anymore but what it actually ends up doing is creating more violence creating more issues because these half measures and not winning wars doesn't actually lead to peace as we may have seen in places like iraq and afghanistan right fighting fighting to stalemates and then removing yeah. yourself yeah it's it, it it's, i would argue it's, we did better than that in it, afghanistan it, and iraq and still just like peaced out and left a vacuum it's, it, it, it's kicking the can down the road um that's one thing i was also going to mention uh, barton swaim has a, a column in, in the journal where he talks about biden's role in this everyone's like oh my gosh i can't believe that you know we're at this point where he's threatening aid and he's basically saying This is not a surprise at all if you look at Biden's political track record going back decades Mm -hmm. where he has been of one position and and fairly conservative as a Democrat uh, and then easily bullied uh, and amenable to the left, whether it is abortion, whether it is the issue of uh, justice, uh, you know, confirmation for Robert Bork and Clarence Thomas or uh, Israel now. Uh, He is of one position. They tell him what to do. He does it. Yeah, that's it. Well, and they are they are sweating those votes in um, among the young cohort, yeah. which are not happy with Biden over this. Uh, and then, of course, Arab American votes in yeah. Michigan, which could be decisive. Although it's not a huge number, but it is a number that is larger than the than the margins. Yeah, it's in obviously on his mind, Michigan, uh, and he's getting dinged by both sides uh, for his reaction to what's happening uh, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, but even when he is in, unless he completely cuts off a, they might think that this is the only way they can win back these voters is by saying, we're turning our back on Israel. Um, you know, Good luck I mean, because, we, 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 we have their back if Iran launches nuclear missiles, which we might have enabled. But other than that, <laughs> you know, it's uh, crazy making. It is crazy making. Imagine and, how crazy making it is in Israel, right? Yeah. Where, yeah. Uh, you know, much of the feedback when I was in Israel was, 
extremely positive about Biden because there was a sense at the beginning that when he came to the country, when he spoke out, now I would, I argued at the time, like there were some weird messages in that first 24 hours, but it settled, it settled and he got it under control and he took his sort of gut pro-Israel position out to the world, which was the correct move. And then I said, "Mm, let's wait how long this lasts. It lasted longer than I thought it would um, because, you know, a lot of, times when we back in Israel and an Israeli war of any kind, it lasts about a month. And then we're like, no, OK, you guys, yeah. you guys get stopped. Um, but they were very positive toward Biden. I wonder what the feeling is yeah. this week. And then on top of that, and this is what worries me for the West in general, not to get all apocalypto on you, but um, there is considerable political upheaval in Israel. There There's is. a schism there among the families yep. of the hostages about yep. how this is being handled. Many people are upset with Netanyahu for how this has been sure. conducted, that it has been this slow yep. walk, many feel, um, even though there's this war cabinet and this unified government. So that's yep. that uh, protects him from some of the backlash. People want to be fighting the war, but they are mad about how this is going. And what concerns me is that in a true existential battle, you're still having this sort of falling apart at the seams politically. Yeah. And then America not backing them is just going to make that worse inside the country. Right. Ugh. I mean, on the one hand, you think, you know, Israel's strong enough and, and, and you know, they've been in this position before, right? Yes. In 48, 67, 73. Right. Um, and, and, and they're resilient and they're not going to care if the world hates them. They're used to that. Uh, on the other hand, um, this could end badly. Yeah, no, I I felt I, fe- I still feel that we uh, the American government and it, all its might and strength and PR power in the world, which still does exist, yeah. uh, should be on the side of civilization, yeah. civilized people right. versus uh, not, the cult of death, not Hamas. Yeah, uh, and yet we are taking a different path. It's amazing. It's uh, it's sort of scrambling my brain. Yeah. Um, and yes, we. Uh, I am concerned uh, about how this looks going forward. Now, one of the re- I should note one of the reasons some have posited that they're moving troops could be not necessarily in an attempt to assuage the U.S. or Biden, but because and this is another scary idea, because they need those troops yeah. in the north. That's right. Because things might pop off there. Sure, Hezbollah, Lebanon. Oh dear. Okay. Well, on a slightly sunnier note, oh. can we go to California? Oh, we're at. A college oh, yes. called Pomona. A great hero emerged. Hold on one second. Her name is President Gabby Starr. And uh, here she is telling some students, uh, pro Hamas students who uh, broke, you know, school codes, possibly laws. Uh, they're in some administrative building yeah. occupying, Occupiers. as they do. And uh, they have a right to. here's what she has to say to them. Excuse me? Everyone in this building is immediately subject to suspension. Harassment is following me with a camera that is now clear. If you do not leave within the next 10 minutes, every student in this building is immediately suspended from this institution. If you are from Pomona, if you are from elsewhere, you immediately will be banned from this campus. Is that clear? Ten minutes. Girl, I love that mom voice. I love the attitude. I love the consequences. She followed up on it later. People indeed were suspended. Well, that's Uh, for the frustrating part is that I think only a handful left and that the uh, and, and that the others chose, OK, and we'll lawyer up, I guess, or whatever no, they plan I think, to do. I think they don't think anything's going to happen to them. And why would they think any different after <laughs> right, being sure. on a college They've campus? They've been coddled for right. so long, maybe. they. Uh, so some of them were suspended. Uh, this is the way that administrators should talk to these young adults mm-hmm. who do not act like adults. They act like children. Yeah. If you want to be a little revolutionary and you want to break the law and break right. your school clo- clo- codes for the right. marginalized people of Palestine, then you should be prepared to pay a price for that. Yeah. They are not. No, they, they want it both ways. And they have this, obviously, the sense of privilege. We, we've seen some of these videos of who they are. They always have to wear masks, by the way. Oh, yeah. No, no, because, that's part and, of the and uniform. And it's not because they're worried, about co- yeah, they're not worried about COVID. Uh, she said it was so refreshing to hear her because I think, you know, there's this 
I'd still like to think silent majority of Americans who feel that this is madness yeah. and these kids are just having these ridiculous temper tantrums and somebody needs to lay down the law. And so she did. And it was a great feeling. They, these, these kids say, you know, they have it in their minds that it's like 1968 and they're occupying like Columbia University, you know, uh, <laughs> occupy, you know like the SDS or whatever, occupying right. little library and, and the big, you know, and, and we're not leaving. And, 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 and no, no. They're not, they're not putting, they're, they're putting, she's putting her foot down and saying enough is enough. Yeah, good for her. I hope that uh, other administrators uh, looked look at this and say, wow, maybe I should have the courage to do this too, but I'm not going to hold my breath. Yeah, well, I will say at Vanderbilt, which we talked about, oh, yeah. uh, some of those students have been expelled uh, because oh, yeah. they got in a little dust up with the police that included some physical contact, which uh, I'm sure you know is um, a little thing called assault, a little mm -hmm. sprinkling of assault in there. Uh, one of those students, Jack, I don't know how he says his last name, Jack Pitos, a 19, oh, yeah. he announces on Twitter, I'm a 19 year old activist that's been fighting for marginalized people for years. I mean, how many years? You're 19. He must have been uh, when he was 10. Don't you remember him at 10? Yesterday, I was expelled from Vanderbilt University for peacefully protesting the genocide in Palestine. Again, he was I believe he was among those arrested for uh, the light assault. Vanderbilt will they, let sexual assaulters walk free, but expel passionate organizers. Okay. They forced their way in. There's a video of them forcing their way past the guards. Yes. And I said, because in his uh, in his profile picture... Uh, he's in. He's on the White House lawn. Oh yeah, with it with a collared shirt. I believe it's pink uh -huh. collared shirt and a the pin Columbia jacket oh, on. Yeah. And I said, "Is it the privilegiest privilege to imagine that you can be a little revolutionary, <laughs> swat at some cops, push teachers over on your way into the mm -hmm. building, um, and then have people bring you food?" And yeah. medical services and a diploma. Yeah, it's my right. That's his. That's what he thinks. Yeah, that's what he thinks. I get to do it all. Someone did a little digging on Jack, by the way. A nineteen-year-old Jack uh, was also part of the uh, the backlash against the DeSantis uh, organized backlash against the DeSantis bill yes. about uh, teaching In gender Florida. studies to yeah. kindergartners. And um, as a result of that activism, he apparently was at the White House meeting Biden a couple times. Uh, yeah, so. there's a great picture of him with uh, the entire set. It's yeah. uh, Joe and Dr. Jill and Kamala and Doug Emhoff. It doesn't get any better than that. No, this. I'm sure he'll have a job anytime now working for the yeah. campaign in some high profile way. Good for Vanderbilt. <laughs> I'm, I'm not good really for kidding. Good for Vanderbilt. And again, you, you hope that it... Uh, um, serves an example for these other college administrators who have more often than not bowed uh, to these right. activists because of fearing, you know, cowardice. Uh, and, uh, for example, our uh, our deputy editor at The Beacon, Andrew Tobin, who's in Tel Aviv, uh, he just did a piece that's out today about uh, students. There's an exchange uh, program for like the master's program, I believe, uh, or a dual degree program with Tel Aviv University and Columbia. And those uh, Israeli students who then have to go to Columbia don't want to go to Columbia now. Yeah. They see what's happening and they don't feel safe. And, it, you know, I mean, in the old days, we, oh, you know, we don't feel safe and we used to laugh at this. But they're literally, you know, in this position where they no, could No, this be, is not a snowflake could, situation. No, no, this they is, could be harmed. Uh, and they this is what attacked. I say is, right, like, the, the colleges have They're spent... surrounded by posters <laughs> that say death to, you know, you know Zionists. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. a viral clip, by the way, of... Uh, Protesters at like a, they're like Democratic voters. Oh yeah, yelling death to, death America, to America in a viral is, clip, yeah. which we can find yeah. that one and, and play it for you guys. International Day of Quds. This is why he would say to pour all of your all of your chants and all of your shouts upon the head of America. But yeah, much in both foreign policy and uh on college campuses uh if you do not punish bad actors right. you incentivize more bad acting right. and uh on these college campuses it's gotten really really nasty and they've spent so many years focusing on the snowflake nonsense 
and harm caused by words yeah. when in fact like harassment and actual physical assault or uh you know jewish students having to lock themselves in very various places yeah. to try to figure out how to escape like those things are act are actual harm they are beyond speech you should punish them yeah so um yeah maybe this will turn a corner for for those who are willing to stand up so yeah. good good job uh to her and, and to uh and the to vanderbilt Vandy. administration okay um over to the house which has its own um inmates running the asylum House Speaker Mike Johnson is facing down, this is CNN reporting, yet another pivotal week of his speakership as he confronts both the threat of an ouster and mounting pressure to decide whether he will finally move ahead on aid to Ukraine, which he's been pledging to pursue for months. So the deal is um, Marjorie Taylor Greene has been talking about ousting the guy because this House majority has a metaphorical death wish uh, and wants to yeah. hand the speakership over to Jeffries. Yeah, Hakeem, uh, who, Jeffries. Hakeem Jeffries, who is the Democrat counterpart. Yeah, they would rather. Of Mike Johnson, uh, of course, something that would tick off the likes of uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is aid to Ukraine, which he has promised to bring up. He says it's a moral test. Uh, we must do this in order to attract enough Democratic voters, Democrat votes to get that passed. He yeah. would tick off Greene perhaps enough to try to oust him. Right. Um, there's also the issue of if you want to wrap Israel aid into that, a bunch of the left starts defecting because mm -hmm. they don't want to have anything to to do with that um we're doing great we're doing great there is a uh, uh a real problem because of the rules committee here mm -hmm. uh and it was conditioned for kevin mccarthy when he wanted that speakership so badly as we right. remember but the house majority was so narrow that in order for him to secure the votes of members of those freedom caucus uh, uh members like uh, marjorie taylor green and matt gates and others they wanted spots on that committee. Right. And not only that, but that it would only take, you know, one or two members, how many they said, to to um, uh, motion for uh, vacating the speakership. Right. That has put, obviously, Kevin McCarthy ultimately paid a price because once you get into something that they don't like, you're gone. Yeah. We'll get the next guy. And I remember- and here they are. Marjorie Taylor Greene saying that, you know, we got a real conservative here, Mike, mm -hmm. Mike Johnson- Mike Johnson trying to get a, the job done. He has uh, a, I don't, does he I have do a not, one vote I do not, majority now? Almost, yeah. Right? Because uh, uh, Gallagher is leaving. Gallagher is leaving. Uh, yeah. Uh, McCarthy has left. Yeah. Buck has left. That's right. Right. right? Colorado, Which, it's... by the way, I think you should do your term. I don't care how bad the chaos part of the caucus is. You promised voters two years you should do the job well, if, for two years. it's like my rule of any job try to even if it's a horrible try to stick it out for a year at least yes and then leave a year minimum anyway same thing finish the term but yeah. now if they've had enough they're done with it and they clearly don't miss it uh no. but now mike I, johnson who uh is um by all accounts a conservative guy uh is in this position because i mean the impulse in him is yes we need to help ukraine and obviously we need to help israel right. uh but establishment is, yeah a stat, he's a member of the establishment now and uh you know this is how policy is made it's back and forth in particular when you don't have super majorities in both uh chambers of congress you are going to have to make these deals and the the difference is you know in the early years of the gingrich revolution right right um he had the gingrich he had tom delay as the whip and uh Members were lockstep. They grumbled. They hated it. And eventually they were able to get rid of Newt, right? Right. But, and there was a failed coup, if you remember. Uh, but lockstep. And something tells me if they hand this over to Hakeem Jeffries, right. those Democrats are not going to have the issues that we have. <laughs> yeah. They're just going to be like, yes, no. on everything. But the good news is that the uh, Republicans who will be responsible for Hakeem Jeffries as the next Speaker of the House... Uh, they will be perfectly content being in the minority. Oh, no, it's And a, they get to just say all the terrible things they did. It's an advantage. Yeah. They'd uh, rather that's, be on the sidelines that's, that's the throwing issue. the bombs. That's the issue is that the, the incentives have changed such that someone yeah. like a DeLay or a yeah. Gingrich trying to keep people in line, if you're trying to do that, uh, keeping people in line is not considered mm -hmm. a virtue uh, because I'm not sure winning 
or passing policy is considered a virtue in parts of the no, caucus. No. And what is considered owning, owning it is, is a virtue. Yes. Uh, what is considered a virtue is like having a big profile, getting a lot of attention, yeah. complaining about the establishment, which I have many complaints. I think all of you guys are pretty bad at doing this job. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But, but the idea that, yes, you're correct. If, if Jeffries became the speaker, oh. the people who caused Jeffries to become the speaker will just point their fingers at everyone else yeah. and say, aha, this is just vindication for the fact that we got rid of two speakers. Yes. Yay. 4D chess, everybody. Yes. Uh, no, that, 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 that's exactly right. By the way, the uh, House, uh, just a, more updates from the Congress, uh, the House is going to send the Mayorkas impeachment articles over to the Senate this week. Yeah. So they did get that done. Uh, and they will have a fight over Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which enables the government to obtain intelligence by collecting communications from foreign persons based overseas who are uh, yeah. using U.S.-based communication services. This is a controversial yeah. part of uh, FISA, and um, and there will be a showdown over that. Of uh, well, yeah, in the Senate, Senate as, we, as, for, as, as of now, right, it's still under the control, just barely, of the Democrats. Right. But uh, this, uh, you know, uh, if the Senate gets that uh, ability or the chance to uh, impeach Mayorkas, they're not going to do that. Schumer will table that. Right. Uh, and so that's the problem they have. But when you think about the House and you think about all the uh, separate investigations that they have launched and looked into and whistleblowers and everything to that matter, the IRS, you name it, that's all because of that narrow Republican majority. And once Akeem Jeffries takes over, all of that's gone. You're not yeah. going to hear any more, any of these investigations, the campus anti-Semitism. Oh, right. No, all of that's out the window. Oh, no, no. Everything's great. Yeah. Okay. So They'll go back to finding ways maybe to let's disqualify not. Trump, you know. Maybe let's right. not. Okay. Yeah. Um, then we... it's, I was going to say, yeah, it's yeah. just, it's, it's, I call it, it's the no loaf caucus, right? They'd right. rather have no loaf. Than... It, I mean, and I'm not even going to say it's a half loaf, but a quarter loaf. But when, let me tell you, when you're hungry, you'll take the quarter. Like I'm hungry right now. Okay. President Biden is once again attempting to hand out student loan cancellation. Oh. Taking another shot at it, in a visit to Wisconsin on Monday, he detailed a proposal that would cancel at least some debt for more than 30 million Americans. It's been in the works for months after the Supreme Court rejected Biden's first try at mass cancellation. They rejected it because it had no basis in his actual powers or law. And it was just yeah. like a real stretch, guys. Um, just uh, unconstitutional, that one. Uh, so Biden Biden basically went to the Secretary of Education and was like, y'all need to go through a process. Or did he do that? Who knows? Anyway, someone went to the Secretary of Education and said, y'all need to go through a rulemaking process to figure out somehow yeah. under the Education Secretary's authority, you can forgive some of this. Right. Um, and so they're trying a different tack. Um, and who knows uh, whether it's legal or not. It uses the higher... Education Act um, and plans to target five new categories of borrowers. But right. here's the thing. Look, I, he's obviously it's I don't want to be uncharitable, but this is buying votes like this is a <laughs> this is a yeah. demographic yeah. overeducated in debt, uh, mostly affluent voters, mm -hmm. many of whom have advanced degrees. Yeah. Right. And new. And I'm sh quite sure understood the terms of their loans um, that he's giving this yeah. to. Uh, but it's a ra it's sort of a small set of voters. Right. Uh, so ostensibly, I mean, I get what they're trying to do because interest rates uh, for these students loan the student loans are, are out of control. Right. You know, tuition is out of control. Uh, people. It's almost like when you subsidize. Uh, to an insane degree, yeah. With that's right, government funds, and no one pays a price for any of that. Somebody's paying a price. Yeah, uh, yeah. that the 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 universities just keep upping tuition, and yeah. all their DEI staffs, and all their administrative staffs, massive, and massive staff, administrative structures. A lot of these schools have more administrators than teachers now, or students, or whatever. Hmm. Uh, so I get that, right? Like when I when I went to Georgetown, uh, tuition was like twenty three, twenty four thousand. Right. It's now sixty seven thousand. It is not keeping pace with inflation. It's way above that. You throw in room and board, any of these other elite schools, Yale right. or whatever, it's ninety thousand. Now we're gonna be getting you know, in a year or two. And on top of that, you don't get educated anymore. And so you, you it's get brainwashed. Quite a, 
when all, you could be you could have had a job and made a lot of money as an electrician <laughs> yeah. or a plumber. Some I think about welding. that myself. I'm not so sure anymore about mechanics because of the electric cars. I think the electric cars are going to put these guys out of business. That's my fear. But certainly with electricians and mechanics, um, uh, plumbers and whatnot, um, that's a job. But no, there's really no incentive for that. But there is an incentive for you to take out these loans and major in whatever it is. And then right. suddenly you're out of college and you cannot find a job because your major is not something that is able to pay off the massive loan that you just took out. There are choices here. And again, I get it because you know there are, there are folks out there who their their interest is more than the money they took out initially. It's out of control, but right. this is not a way to solve it. That's the that's the first thing. The second thing is um the the incentive structure is completely uh askewed now, right? So right. you have um you know, the idea that you want to be frugal and you want to save yeah. in order to pay for college. When in fact, you know, we, you put all this money away, you don't go on vacation, you don't buy anything fancy or whatever. You have this money as parents and you drain that account, your savings account, your 401k, whatever, to pay for now close to a million dollars for two kids, right? And suddenly uh, the other person who took out all these loans, yeah, doesn't have to pay. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's part of it, right? Is that I, look, I of course concede that things are much more expensive now than when I went to school, even by, you know, if you account for inflation and all of that. However, the incentives part is still operative. Yes. That I made decisions based on what I could afford. Right. I went to a state school where I was offered scholarships mm -hmm. for a reason. Um, other people I know went to extremely expensive schools yeah. uh, and who knows they might be done paying off now but like there is there is a base, basic unfairness in yeah those who made certain decisions and maybe didn't get certain opportunities of elite schools right. because they made those decisions right. uh now get to foot the bill for the rest yeah. of these folks the other thing is um this is a classic case of like the government causes the problem in large part and then is like we'll solve the problem and the way that they solve the problem is by once again costing taxpayers huge amounts of money. Yeah. So because government sort of took over this financial yeah. aid area. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there is kind of no cap on the amount of aid and like how it skyrockets. And right. the universities are like, hell yeah, right. daddy government is going to take care of this. Yeah. We'll just add as much fluff as we want to. Meanwhile, uh, having taken over this process, they cannot do the basics. Have you heard about the FAFSA? crisis no you're gonna have to explain that one to okay me. i will explain it uh if you don't have someone applying for college right now it's like not top of mind fafsa is the uh free application for federal student aid Got it. okay yeah. and it's it's a huge part of yep. the college application process it happens online uh the u.s department of education was asked by congress to make some changes calculate for inflation so that you protect more income of the families that are applying because obviously their dollar doesn't go as far as right. it used to. Uh, gee, I wonder who caused that problem. Uh, they asked them to revamp the online system uh -huh. to make the system more streamlined and simpler. It went about as well as the Obamacare oh. online launch did. So it's supposed to launch in October of uh -huh. last year so that people can start getting their right. financial information because that financial information then has to go to the schools and the schools vet it and decide what package they're going to offer students. Students can't decide where they want to go to school until they know what they're offered as part of this program. It doesn't go online until December. So we're already several months behind. They didn't do the calculation for inflation. Oh boy. They just left that one. So now they're faced with a system that doesn't work online, families that are months behind and having to re refile not just their FAFSA applications, oh, but in some cases, the college applications yeah. oh, come for on. financial aid. OK. And then the question is, do they want to do the calculation right. for inflation so that these families get what technically they are supposed to under the law? But that would require another rollout of the online system, which is already, excuse my French, effed. OK. <laughs> So that's yeah. government trying to do 
the basics of yeah. the system. Maybe stop coming up with new creative ways to do things, guys, and just do the thing you're supposed to do. You know, it, it, after all these years, they still believe that government intervention always leads oh, to like great just... outcomes. Not it's, good. Yeah, I mean, we've been saying this. I mean, they're for talking about all decades. these all these students who, by the way, their four years of high school were twenty twenty to now. Okay, they had a terrible high school yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless they live somewhere normal, in which case it's slightly better. Um, but now they're, you know, they've been applying to colleges over and over again and yeah. having to go through the system over and over again for months on end. Yeah. And these families who are trying to do things responsibly little they, they should take a look around and say see that they don't need to do that mm -hmm. are changing where their investments lie so that they can get more aggressive so that they mm -hmm. can have more money hopefully to put into their kids funds to pay for college it is a disaster from top yeah. to bottom at least they'll probably learn a lesson from this government mm -hmm. and say you know what mm -hmm. we, we we've, we've learned our lesson we're not going to do this again uh you could always find see what's going to happen is uh the Biden administration, when they roll out this next right. big thing, mm -hmm. uh, they'll find their examples of people who are struggling, in fact, you know, who said, oh, I only wanted to borrow this much. And now I've paid tens of thousands of dollars more in interest over all these years. And right. I've been paying off my debt for like 30 years or whatever. But you're also going to be able to find examples of people who have then ha taken advantage of that situation because they had double degrees or they, you know, just bounced around. They really didn't need to take out that loan and, hey, they're going to get that and they didn't have to work or whatever and they're going to get that, they're going to get that loan uh, taken care of. If if the borrower gets their debt canceled, right, this is a thing moving forward. Right. And if, if Biden and Harris win again, then, you know, it, it's going to keep on, they're going to keep on trying to do this until, and if well, yeah. they have their way, is it even called borrowing anymore? No, it's just like. But by, by the way, they continue it's to not hit, a loan. Is it a loan? Well, they continue to hit any person, particularly in Congress, who points out that this is a problem with the PPP loan. Oh, sure, right, right. Which were not loans, actually. This yeah. is you're in an abusive relationship with your government. Okay, <laughs> that's how this works. Yeah. If you go, if they beg you to come get the help they yeah. offered, which yeah. is the PPP loan, right, which is a repayment to you for damage done by the government, which told you to stop working and to shut down your business. If right. you go get that help, which is not a loan, yeah. was not structured mm -hmm. to be repaid, mm -hmm. was a grant. If you go get that help and then you point out that forgiving actual loans that yeah. had different terms is not the way to do business, they will then hammer you yeah. You're for, the having, hypocrite. for having taken the help that they told you to take from them. Yeah. Don't get involved with these people, y'all. <laughs> Gaslighters, yeah, emotionally abusive. I don't appreciate it. They imposed this on you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Anyway, FAFSA, y'all, college students, parents. This is terrifying. Punish these people. Yeah. This is trash. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was reading up and I was like, my God. No. He's maybe maybe work on buying off this segment over yeah. here, guys, because they're going to be real I, pissed around I strongly, uh, election time. I strongly encourage my son to think about NROTC. <laughs> Dude, I know. It's, and oh. certainly state schools. Okay. Yeah, I, I had a discussion with the girls the other day about, they were talking about college. And I was like, well, we'll see what college looks like around the time you guys yeah. are applying. Let's, I mean, uh, we keep on talking about this bubble out to burst. I, soon. Not if the government keeps doing no, this. No. Okay. I have a correction, Mary Kathy. Oh, my goodness. Listener James Berrettini informs us that our pronunciation of the author of the Harry Potter books is incorrect. How did we oh, say it? I say Rowling. But I, so I did I, like yeah. Rowling. Yeah. He says it's rolling rhymes with bowling. All right, JK fair enough. J.K. Rowling. Fair enough. All right. You know, I only see it in writing. I actually don't, you know, I haven't engaged with it uh, that way. I haven't and, met her in person. No, I, but, but I love the books, especially the characters. Hermie won. She's great. <laughs> Love her. And I love her, me one. Okay, that wraps up this episode of Getting Hammered. Uh, remember, you can subscribe, subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. And you can follow me on Twitter at Victoria Mattis. By the way, Mary Catherine, what is up with everybody getting blue checks, blue check marks now, except for me? Everybody oh, has yeah. them. That's... There are people with fewer followers than me and more followers, but they oh. all have them. I'm like the only one without. I'll see what I can do for you. Um. By the way, that's another incentive structure that just got blown up yeah. because a bunch of people paid for that thing. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, anyway, uh, by the way, 
I'm at MK Hammer on Twitter, at MK Hammer Time on Instagram. You can follow the show at Getting Hammer Podcast on YouTube or Instagram. And you should like rate us and follow us and tell your friends and uh, give us a good review. Uh, also, which Harry Potter house are you in, Vic? Oh, I would probably be um, Slytherin. I don't I know. know. He's, got, he's got the dark green oh, shirt on. Dark green shirt. Yeah, Slytherin. You might be Slytherin. Salazar. I don't Slytherin. know. I don't know. You're so you're so charming. I, the people def- love you. Definitely not Hufflepuff. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so I am I am Gryffindor. I've taken many a quiz. Green yourself. I know. Okay. I've taken, you've taken the quiz. I've taken oh. many a quiz because my children insist yes. upon it. I've got one Ravenclaw and are. one Gryffindor mm. or Hufflepuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the Ravenclaw is very clear. Uh, I keep wanting to f- have a different result because I think like everybody, like it's sort of basic. Like everybody yeah. wants to yeah. be Gryffindor. Uh-huh. It's the main character's yeah. house. But I yeah, keep, I keep popping popular. Gryffindor, man. I'm, very, know, I'm I, a very brave person. I, I only I can only <laughs> guess what house I belong to because the sorting hat doesn't actually fit my head. <laughs> Do you know what Steve says? Because he'll never take a, t- a quiz. He won't. The kids beg him. He won't take a quiz because uh, he doesn't like school. And uh, he is a centaur who lives in the forest oh, yes. outside the school. Yeah. And that is his, those are his people. Similar build. Mm-hmm. That's what he says. So anyway, a little insight into my family and into Vic Slytherin. Not surprised. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for getting hammered responsibly. This has been a Nebulous Media Podcast. <laughs>